A priori, what we have seen up to now is uh, a method that was based on an assumption which was the delta t minimum that was telling us that the uh, the temperature difference that allows to justify an investment for a heat recovery exchanger uh, has to be bigger than the delta t minimum that we have calculated. And this system is uh, allows us to have um, uh, an indication of um, where is the best trade-off <coughs> between the investment and the value of the energy saving. Uh, when we have defined this, we have afterwards realized that heat recovery is not so easy to identify. So last year, last week, you have made an exercise that has shown that okay, there were several options, several hot streams that can be used to heat up cold streams. And then, facing this, we have been uh, presenting a method that is the, the calculation of the heat cascade that allows to make the integral of all the heat that is available in all the hot streams in the system to match this uh, availability of heat with the needs of heat that is defined by the integral as a function of the temperature of the heat that is needed by all the cold streams that you have in the system. And by shifting one curve with respect to the other one, we were able to identify what is the maximum heat recovery that can be realized by heating up the core streams using the hot streams. And the maximum amount that can be recovered is defined by the value of the delta T minimum. So uh, it is defined by the fact that, that you have at least to have a temperature difference equal to the delta T minimum. Uh, between all the hot streams that need to be cooled down and all the cold streams that needs to be uh, or that will be uh, heated up. From this analysis, then um, there was an algorithm that was proposed in order to make this calculation, which was based on the corrected temperatures and the calculation of the heat cascade. And uh, something which was also very important is that we have realized that the um, the, the pinch point, which is the place where the temperature difference is equal to the minimum, was uh, really defining characteristics of the heat recovery. Above the pinch, we have to cool down the hot streams up to the pinch temperature, and we have to use this heat load to heat up the cold streams, uh, and they will, not be, uh, they will not have enough. So it means that you will have to complement with an additional amount that will come from the energy that you will have to buy. Below the pinch, we have seen that uh, the heat in the hot stream is much bigger than the uh, is bigger than the, the the heat needed by the cold streams. Which means that uh, we have to install heat recovery heat exchangers to preheat all the cold streams that are below the pinch to reach the temperature of the pinch if they need to reach the, the pinch temperature uh, by using heat recovery from the hot streams that are uh, below the pinch. And this analysis were afterwards telling us, so now we can look at the whole system, look at the whole, all the heat exchangers that are in the system and identify the one that have to be replaced. Because if I'm using a cold utility above the pinch, it's not a good idea. Using a hot utility below the pinch is not a good idea because I have enough heat in the in the hot and cold streams, and um, if there is a heat recovery heat exchanger that is taking heat from above the pinch to heat something which is below the pinch, it is creating a penalty. And we have seen that as soon as I have a penalty on the hot utility, I have the same on the cold utility, because the overall energy balance is always the same. Okay, The sum of the heat of the hot stream is always uh, the same and defines the, the total heat that is available and the, the heat that is needed by the cold streams is always the same as that is not changing by the heat recovery. So we have made this analysis and then some of you have said, yeah, but you tell me how much I can recover, but you do not tell me how. Okay, so I, I still do not know what is, uh, what, where I have to place the heat exchangers. Okay, which means that I have in fact to define which hot stream is connected with which cold one. Yeah. 
what is the amount of heat that is exchanged in this connection? So what is the size of the heat exchanger in terms of heat load and then afterwards in terms of investment? And how do I have to do it? Because it's possible that the streams, the heat exchangers can be put in series or can be put in parallel. I can always split a stream into two branches to do the heat exchange. So it means that I have to find the, uh, the structure of the heat exchanger uh, network or configuration. And I would like to find those connections that satisfy the minimum energy requirement that I have just calculated or that, that satisfies the maximum uh, heat recovery. Okay? And ideally, I would like to do it with the minimum number of heat exchangers because I know that each time I have to buy a heat exchanger, it will cost the pipes to connect. So the, the minimum number is important, and I have to invest the minimum. So it means that the size has also to be optimized. Okay, so how can I use what I have learned last week in order to design the heat exchanger network? And so what I'm going to do first is to realize that I, ha I was saying that above the pinch, the heat of the hot stream needs to be used in order to preheat the cold streams. Above the pinch, I have a heat sink, so it means that there is no reason to cool a hot stream with a cold utility. Okay. It has to be used for heating the cold stream. So what I can deduce from this is that my mission is to find for each of the hot stream that, are, that is above the pinch, a heat exchanger that is going to heat up uh, a cold stream that is also above the pinch. Okay, so this is the, the first mission above the pinch, cool down all the hot streams to the target temperature or to the pinch temperature by uh, using the cold streams that needs to be heated up. So it means that to some extent I'm doing this. So I have the hot and the cold composite, so I have the hot one here and the cold here, um, and I can plot the different hot and cold streams in this way. Put as a function of the temperature where they are located. So pay attention that it's, it's just a vertical uh, a line. I'm not uh, declaring a direction, okay? So it means that I can have things like this, and when I will introduce a heat exchange between uh, streams that needs to be heated and the streams that need to be cooled down, I'm going to add an horizontal line. So it means that now I'm linking two streams, one that needs to be heated and one that needs to be cooled down. So this is the hot stream of the heat exchanger. This is the cold stream of the heat exchanger. If I'm doing it like this, so you, what you can see is that you have the counter current representation. Okay, so the hottest temperatures are here and here and the, cool, the coolest are here and here. And as soon as I have uh, define the temperature here, here, and here by the energy balance, I will be able to calculate the heat exchange area that is needed between a hot stream and a, course, uh, and a corresponding cold stream. Okay? And the energy balance is telling me that the heat load to go from there to there is equal to the heat load that goes from there to there. Something which is important is that we have learned that um, it was important to look at the, the pinch temperature. And for this, I will have to uh, uh, identify, so the, the, uh, sorry, uh, the, what we name the pinch heat exchangers. A pinch heat exchanger is a heat exchanger that has both ends at the pinch. Something which is important is that as soon as they have they are both they have both ends at the pinch, like it, like, like the heat exchanger number three, which is shown here. It means that this heat exchanger uh, has something that we know, because we know that the temperature between this stream and this one is equal to the delta T minimum. Okay, so at the pinch temperature, we know that the hot stream is. Hot, uh, the hot stream is hotter than the cold streams by a uh, value of the delta T minimum at the pinch. Okay, so me, it means that here 
I know the temperature difference. Okay? And this type of heat exchanger where both ends are at the pinch are named the pinch heat exchangers. Okay? It means that the number one here is not a pinch heat exchanger because it, here it is at a pinch, but here it's not. The number four is the same, okay? It's, it's not a pinch heat exchanger. The number two is not a pinch heat exchanger because the temperature here is at the pinch, but the end temperature here is below the pinch. It's not reaching the pinch, okay? So among all the heat exchangers that I have here, only one has something which is perfectly known, known the temperature between here and here, okay? So those are the pinch uh, heat exchangers. So the pinch heat exchangers, in fact, link pinch uh, strings. Okay. Now, another thing that is important here is that uh, we have exchange that are in parallel because I have split this flow into two flows. Okay. So the one and the four are parallel heat exchangers, while the three and the two are uh, sequential heat exchangers, as well as the four and the three in uh, the, the dimension of the hot stream. Okay, so it means that I have um, the the uh, uh, definition of a representation of a heat exchanger network here. Okay, because if I have this, uh, I can describe where are all the heat exchangers that connect the hot and the cold streams. So this is what is named the grid representation of the heat exchanger network. Okay? Vertical lines for the temperatures and horizontal lines for uh, the heat exchange. Okay? Very useful representation, fast and uh, uh, visualizing the counter current as well as the fact that the heat exchangers are in parallel or in series. Okay, so with those definitions, what can I do now? So I'm going to look at uh, the pinch streams. So the pinch streams are the streams that reach the pinch. Okay, it's possible that they will cross the pinch, but at least they are at the pinch. So I'm not going to discuss about the others because <coughs> the most important is that all the streams that reach the hot streams that reach the pinch uh, above the pinch uh, will have to reach the temperature of the pinch. Okay, and I know that at this point the temperature difference is equal to the delta T minimum. Okay, so in fact, when I'm saying this, I will identify that I have uh, feasibility rules that uh, defines the feasibility with respect to the minimum energy requirements. So let me explain you what it means. The first feasibility rule is the number of three. So let's assume that I'm above the pinch and that I have to find. Uh, heat exchangers that are going to take the heat from all the hot streams that needs to reach the pinch without hot cold utility. Okay, so it means that if I have one stream here, a hot stream that is connected to a cold stream, it has to be connected to a cold stream that is at the pinch, okay, because it has to reach the temperature, so nobody else than the pinch streams can allow him to reach the pinch. So it means that it has to find a cold stream like this one, okay, that is at the pinch and that allows this one to go to this pinch temperature. But what you can see is that if I uh, have two streams that need to reach the pinch, okay, uh, and that I have only one that is leaving the pinch, I have a problem because no one is able to cool down this one. Okay? So what do I do? So my system is telling me I have, I need heat for the cold streams, okay? And I have to cool down all the hot streams. Could we separate the flow too? Sorry? Could we separate the flow too fast? Yeah. So the idea is the following, is that if there is not enough cold streams to cool down all the hot streams, then I have to split the cold stream, okay? Splitting the cold streams means that I'm dividing the flow into two parts. Okay? Now, if I'm looking at what it means from the flow perspective, okay, it means that I'm going to reduce, uh, to divide into two parts, which means that 
I will have a smaller flow in one part and a smaller flow in the other one. But what I know is that the sum of the hot is smaller because it has a higher slope than the sum of the cold because I'm above the pinch. So the two curves go in this direction. Okay, so it means that there exists a way to split the cold stream into two parts, and I know that th there will be a split factor that will always allow to the, the two others to, to match. Okay, so it means that I can split the, the cold streams and create two branches. The second feasibility rule is telling me uh, that uh, if at the pinch, if I have a stream like this, uh, a, a heat exchanger like this one, this heat exchanger will be feasible if the MCP of the hot stream is smaller than the MCP of the cold stream. Okay? What does it mean? It means that the slope here is bigger than the slope here. And this is logical, because here I have, I have the delta T minimum. So it means that if this one is bigger than this one, it means it mean that uh, it's smaller than this one, then the slope would be like this. I would have a smaller value of the delta T minimum. Okay? So it means that uh, from this analysis, I know that if I'm connecting a hot stream here with a cold stream, the MCP of this one has to be smaller than the MCP of the other side. Okay? And in addition, as soon as I'm adding this heat exchanger here, those two streams are not anymore available for the others. Okay? I still have another list of hot streams and, and another list of cold streams. Okay? But this one is busy, so the cold stream is busy with the hot stream, okay? So it means that the other one, so it means that the sum minus the one that I have connected, has also to satisfy the same rule. The two curves uh, needs to be, uh, to, to go towards a bigger than 30 minimum, okay? So it means that I have a feasibility of the heat exchanger connections that is telling me that the MCP of the hot stream has to be lower than the MCP of the core stream, and the MCP of all the remaining hot streams have to be, has to be lower than the MCP of all the uh, core streams. Okay? And I know that the sum is also true, okay? because I'm starting from there. The two curves go away one from the other above the pitch. Okay? So it means that now I have a way, first, to verify that I have enough cold streams to cool down all the hot streams. And second, uh, who can co be connected with who? Okay? And in case I do not find anyone that, that, is, uh, that is possible, then I will do exactly the same as I was doing for increasing the, the number, is that I can split the hot stream. So if, if there is no possibility of, uh, uh, of having a, uh, the MCP of the cold stream, of the hot stream being smaller than the MCP of the cold stream, then what I will, will do is to reduce the flow of the hot stream, okay, by splitting. Yeah? And in this case, uh, in, uh, like, like it is seen here, I will be able to connect the first one and I will be able to connect the second one. And of course, by doing this, what I'm, I'm doing is that I'm increasing uh, the number of hot streams. Okay? So it's not impossible that I will be facing a problem of not having enough cold streams, which means that I will have then, then to split the cold stream as well. Okay, so by saying this, uh, we have, in fact, feasibility, feasibility rules that allows us to, to define which are, among all the hot and cold streams that I have, the one that can be and that have to be connected. I'm starting from the pinch point because this is the place where I know the value of the delta T minimum, and I'm going to define who is the, the, the good one to be connected. And then, 
I'm going to calculate what is the heat load of the heat exchanger. Okay? So the heat load of the heat exchanger is um, calculated in such a way that we will try to satisfy the needs of one of the two streams. Okay? Uh, it means that I'm going to go start from here because this is where I know, and I'm going to go up uh, towards the higher the increase of the temperatures here and increase of the temperatures here. Okay, and I'm going to calculate the inlet conditions of the hot stream, the inlet the outlet conditions of the core stream, starting from a temperature difference that I know. Uh, in the beginning, so I know the two temperatures here. Okay? And what I'm going to use is I'm going to use the heat load that is the minimum of the heat load needed by the cold stream and the heat load available in the hot stream. So I'm calculating the two value and I'm choosing the one that is uh, satisfying the uh, the heat load. Okay. By the, this is what we name the the tick of rule is the rule that says that um, as soon as I'm placing a heat exchanger, I'm trying to uh, satisfy the needs okay? of one of the two sides. Okay? That's a way to minimize the number of connections. Okay. Now, it means that I have defined a way to see who is connected with whom and what is the heat load. Okay? Something that remains to be, to be uh, added is, okay, let's try to see where I have to start because I still have a lot of hot stream and I still have a lot of cold stream. So the idea would be to say, let's start with the streams that have the highest uh, the highest MCP first. So you take the list of all the hot streams, you take the list of all the cold streams, you verify that you have enough cold streams to satisfy the needs of all the hot streams first, and then you select the biggest cold stream, either to split, to create two, uh, if, if you are not enough hot stream, uh, cold streams, uh, or and you, you take the biggest hot stream, and then you try to match them together. Okay? And once you have identified who is connected with who, then you can calculate the amount of heat that is needed. Okay? There is another tick of rule, so uh, another heuristic rule, that is saying that it's always nice to have a stream for which we can manipulate the flow, which means a utility stream, to uh, complete the heat demand of a hot or a cold stream. And the reason for this is that um, it is always easier to control the temperature of those streams. And as this temperature, when you end up to heat or when you end up to cool, is typically the requirement of one process unit, having a way to control it with a valve is always safe from the uh, process perspective. And the consequence for it is that as soon as you uh, need to complete a heat load, then it's better to do it with uh, a hot or a cold utility at the end of uh, the cooling or the heating process. So now I have identified which hot stream can be connected with which cold one and what is the heat load. So it would be nice to verify before going ahead with the next one to verify that the heat exchanger is well placed. And this is what is named the operation of the uh, remaining problem analysis. So the remaining problem analysis is, is going to say that as soon as I, I have placed a heat exchanger, the heat exchanger is going to take part of the heat of the hot stream and take part of the heat of the cold stream. Okay, so it means that this heat is not anymore available for the rest of the world. It is exchange in the heat exchanger that I have just decided. 
Okay? So what I'm going to do now is that I'm going to remove all the calculations by considering that the heat exchanger that I have just placed, so the, the one that goes from T1 to T2 and then and, and from, from, uh, from T2 to T1, so we have from T4 to T3, uh, is not anymore available for the rest of the world. So it means that I'm going to replace the hot stream, which was from uh, here to here, by one that is going from here to here, and a second one that will go from here to here. And I will do the same for the cold stream, so it is split it into two parts, from, from the initial conditions to T4, and from T3 to the target condition. Okay? Uh, so those are new streams that I can add in the heat cascade. Okay? And at the same time, of course, I'm removing, I'm review, uh, removing the initial one. Huh? Okay? So I'm removing the initial one, I'm adding new one, and then I'm calculating the minimum energy requirement. And if the new minimum energy requirement is equal to the previous one, it means that my heat exchanger is at the right place. Okay? So this is what is named the uh, remaining problem analysis. So it means that each time I have placed the heat exchanger, I have to test if it does not create a penalty. And it can create a penalty because sometimes uh, you will see that composite curves are not always going away one from the other. Sometimes they can report, uh, approach again and then go away afterwards. And in this case, it might happen that you will have a, a, a problem of a minimum energy requirement calculations like the one that I'm presenting here for the remaining problem analysis. Okay, so now, having said this, I have a nice method to design the heat exchanger network. Because I can, I have really a systematic way. So the first step is that I have to be sure, and yeah, uh, so, so first I'm going to, uh, all what I have said, sorry, for the, what is happening above the pinch, cooling down the hot streams, is also valid, but inverted, for the core streams that are below the pinch. Okay? So it means that above the pinch, what I have to do is to cool down the hot streams so that they reach the, the pinch temperature without the help of cold utility. And below the pinch, the key streams are the core streams that need to reach the, the temperature of the pinch without the help of a hot utility. Okay? So it's just a mirror. Uh, approach, which allows me then to say, okay, let's assume that I'm above or below the pinch, I decide who is, who is the key stream, so the key stream is hot streams above, cold stream below, and who are the non-key streams, which are the cold streams above and the hot stream below, okay? As soon as I have this, then I verify that the number of uh, hot stream is smaller or equal, of key streams, sorry, is smaller or equal to the number of core streams, of, of non-key streams, sorry. If this is the case, then I can continue. If not, I know that I have to split one stream. And if I'm sp smart, I'm starting as I'm smart, no, no, if, as I'm smart, okay? <laughs> Uh, I will start with the biggest MCP, so, so that I have uh, streams that are of the same order of importance, okay? So once I do this, then I'm splitting so that at the end I have enough uh, non-key streams for all the, the, the key streams that needs to be reach the pinch. Then I'm entering into the feasibility rule that uh, check the MCP. So uh, the MCP is going to tell me um, do I have to split or not the non-key one, uh, the key one, sorry. Uh, so I've split the non-key one here, and I'm, I'm going to uh, decide to split the, the, the key streams if there is no heat exchanger that satisfies this rule. And as soon as I have found one that satisfies the rule of the MCP, then I can place the heat exchanger and calculate its heat load. I'm always starting from the pinch. 
starting from the pinch, going up to the highest temperature when I'm above the pinch, going down in temperature when I'm below the pinch, calculating the heat exchanger, and looking at uh, the remaining problem analysis. And the remaining problem analysis is going to tell me if or not there is a penalty in introducing this heat exchanger. Of course, typically I would not accept to have a penalty, but the pragmatism would sometimes tell you, yeah, uh, perhaps that for this small amount of heat, I would accept to have this heat exchanger that I really like. Okay? So, uh, but nevertheless, so I will have the, the freedom to decide, and as soon as I have decided, I have a new data set. So it means that I have a new list of hot stream, I have a new list of cold stream. I can go back, <coughs> and I have perhaps also a new position of the pinch point. Huh? It might happen that I have a new pinch point. Okay? And as soon as I have done this, then I can restart and, and go back to, uh, to the beginning. Okay, so conclusions. If we know the value of the delta T minimum, if we know the minimum uh, heat exchange, okay, uh, I have been able to show you that there was a method to decide which one of the heat exchanger has to be connected to uh, which one. Okay, which one of the hot or cold stream, sorry, has to be connected with the corresponding uh, cold stream. Okay? Which allows me then to design the heat exchanger network that has, uh, on the one hand, feasibility rules, and then on the other hand, what is named the heuristic rules. So it means it's things that have been learned by the, from the past or recommendations of priorities to be, done, to be set. It's perhaps not the best one. Huh? And of course, something which is important here is that we have to recognize that we have been doing an exercise where there is still some unknown, because I have recommended to take the biggest CP, but perhaps that there are a lot of similar heat exchangers uh, or streams, okay, that are equivalent. And the problem is that each time I take a decision, all the other decisions uh, will be affected. And I, I'm not always sure that I'm taking the right decision. I just have safeguards that allows me to say, okay, I'm going in the right direction, right? But nevertheless, so now we have a method that allows us to, uh, uh, to design the heat exchanger network. So let's, uh, oops, uh, let's stop here. And now I'm going to show you uh, an application. But of course, after the break, right? So if you have questions, I will be happy to answer. But I guess that the, uh, the list of questions will come when you will really apply uh, the system. So what I'm, I'm proposing after the break is that I'm going to solve the problem of the heat exchanger network design for you with one example. And then afterwards, you will have to do the, the same exercise by yourself. So what I'm going to do now is, is uh, to start from uh, the place where we uh, were with the theory, and I'm going to apply it to the example that we had seen last week. So last week we have been doing this, uh, looking at this example, where we have been uh, identifying two hot streams and two, uh, two cold streams and two hot streams, and by the assumption of delta T minimum of 10, so I remind you that the 10 is just because it is simple for me to make plus minus 5. Okay. The reality is that you have translated the right value. Okay? Uh, but knowing this, then we know that the minimum energy return is 20 kilowatts, that there will be a total heat recovery of 385 kilowatts, and we have seen that we have a method to, uh, that allows us to design the heat exchanger. So starting from the pinch position, which is here, so 80 for cold streams and 90 for the hot streams, I can plot the grid representation of the stream. So I have three streams, uh, two streams that go down here, one that goes from low temperature to high temperature, and one that is starting from the pitch. So you have to know that there is always one that is creating the pitch. So there is always one that is creating a kick 
which means the one that has the uh, initial temperature which is at the peak. Okay. So let's uh, start with what is happening above the pinch. So my, I'm starting from the pinch, always starting from the pinch. I know that the temperature of the hot pinch of, of the hot pinch is 90 degrees C, and the cold pinch is 80 degrees C. This is the definition of the position of the pinch, right? Uh, and if I'm working with what is happening above the pinch, then I know that I'm going into this direction. So first question. Uh, do I have enough? So this is the part. Do I have enough cold stream to cool down all the hot streams to the pitch? So do I have? I have to reformulate it. Do I have enough pinch cold stream that are uh, that allows to cool down all the pinch hot stream? And the answer is yes. Okay. It's like if I'm asking you is to or equal to 2. Okay, so it's quite easy to calculate, right? The answer is yes, so it means that I have enough space. So now the question is um, let's do the CP rule. What is the CP rule telling me? Is that the MCP of the hot stream has to be lower than the MCP of the cold stream of any heat exchanger that I will connect. Okay, so which one are you going to connect? So the hot streams are uh, here and the cold stream are here. Yeah. We can connect to the CLG to the green of the hot Okay, and what is the problem? The CP uh I Okay, so it means that in reality there is no connection that is visible out. Because the MCP rule is not only that the hot stream needs to have lower MCP than the cold stream, but the remaining one as well. Okay? So it means that uh, I could have connected this one, seems to be okay, but then I have a problem with the other part of the equation. And I was starting here with the biggest one, so I connected the biggest one to the middle. But as soon as I try to do this one, I have a problem. And the answer to it is split the hot stream. So what I can do now is to split in such a way that I have an MCP here, which is smaller than the MCP here. Okay? So this solution is feasible, but huh? so we, not, we do not have enough cold streams anymore. So at least, uh, if I'm doing this, uh, I will have a, a problem to cool the hot streams. But nevertheless, so I'm, I'm going to show you uh, this first correction here, uh, and I'm going to establish the E1. So it means, sorry, going back here, I'm considering that this one will be correct. Okay? Uh, the reason why I'm saying this huh, is because I'm working, I'm looking at a small point here, which is the, the constraints. Uh, here I know that I have a big one and that I can always split. Okay? So it means that this will be, uh, this is the reason why I can work with this one. So I'm choosing this one. And I have to find what is the heat load. And then for doing this, I have been looking at what is the needs to complete the needs from 155 to, uh, to 90, sorry, 160 to 90 uh, for, for this one and for this one. And so what I have decided in this case, uh, I have looked at the heat loads. I know that the heat load of the hot stream is bigger than the heat load of the cold stream. And I have a constraint on the, on the flow here. So I have finally decided to calculate the flow of this heat, of, of this heat factor here. So I calculate the heat factor in such a way that I will 
finalize by using the heat available here to supply the heat that we need it here. Okay? So I'm calculating the flow, and the answer is 1.07, in such a way that by cooling down the 1.07 from 160 to 90, I will exactly satisfy the heat load that is needed here. Okay? If I would have chosen a, a, a smaller value, then I would, I would not have enough uh, heat available here. A bigger value is still possible, uh, but a lower is less possible. Okay? So, this, is, this was the, the way to calculate this, uh, uh, the size of this heat exchanger. And as soon as I had the size, then I had the way to calculate the U times the area, and then from there I will have the area, and I will have the total cost. Okay? So I have one heat exchanger that is characterized. I have the hot, uh, uh, the hot steams and the cold steams that are calculated. So as soon as I have placed this heat exchanger, I have a new collection of heat exchangers, which is shown here, so now of a uh, heat exchange. Okay? So if this is the, the list of the hot and cold steams. Uh, sorry. Uh, the, the value here is the list of hot and cold scenes when I have placed the E1 between A and C. So I have a new C, I have the B, and I have the B that are still not uh, satisfied. Okay? Okay, now I have the, the next problem you have mentioned. There is, uh, there is not enough cold steams to heat up all the, uh, uh, to cool down all the hot steams. So what I have to do is to split the cold steam. I could have split the A, but the A is already small, so it's better to split the B. And here I have selected the flow uh, here so that there is a, uh, a nice repartition between the, the, the reach the same temperature here, knowing that by definition I will have to reach the temperature kilo up there. So there I have tried to do an isothermal mixing to define what is the best flow between the two. Okay? And don't forget that I'm always going from the lower centuries to the deepest centuries. So it means that the, the flow, uh, I'm, I'm calculating the outer temperature. That's obvious. By doing this, I'm able to calculate all the heat exchangers in, the, uh, in my system. Right? So I know already the E1 that I have calculated, for which I know the tensions, and by knowing the flow, I know the heat, and, and the flow here, I know the heat load. Then I have the E2, which, for which I know the temperature here, I know the flow, and here I know the flow because it's the remaining flow here and uh, the corresponding heat load. And then the E3 is coming from this temperature to 90 and it's going to heat up to 145. And the balance is done by the top security that I'm placing at the end of this uh, cold stream. Okay? And now I can calculate all the heat changes that I have added, so the E1, E2, and E3, for which I know all the temperatures, and all uh, the, the heat load, which allows me to calculate the cost of the heat exchanger uh, that has been installed. Okay? So now I have uh, the answer to the next question. So I know uh, how much heat I have to put in the system, and I have already placed half of the heat exchanger to the one that I want to put. Okay? And I have made a calculation, so I know how much uh, I have to put. So below the pitch, below the pitch I can do the same. So now below the pitch, the key streams are the cold streams. So I have to heat up all the cold streams. They need to reach the pitch without the help of a hot utility. So the first question is, do I have enough hot stream to, to heat up all the cold streams to reach the pitch? The answer is yes or no? Yes. 
So we have enough streams. So two is bigger than one. So uh, it means that we have enough. So we are going to place a bit exchanger. I'm taking the biggest one with the smallest one. Okay. And then I'm calculating the lead load in such a way that one of the two is satisfied. Okay. And it depends, it happens there that if I'm cooling down from 90 to 60 degrees C, the heat load of this heat, uh, of uh, this heat exchanger will be, uh, will be 75 and will, will reach 30 degrees C. Okay. I'm calculating from the pinch and going down. Okay. So, now one, I think that I have completed the, the, with the heat that was available here. So it means that I have to choose uh, something that is going to complete the demand. So which one do I have to connect? I'm connecting B to this one. Okay? But what we can see here is that um, it might be surprising because I'm, I'm 30 here and I'm at the finish here. Okay? But it's normal. I have too much heat available in hot streams. Okay? So the key is that I have to be sure that this one reach 80. The rest is not important. So I can obviously connect uh, the E5 uh, with, a, with a heat exchanger uh, to complete the, the need of the consume. So now E5 is in theory with E4. And then um, I'm calculating the, the temperature at the outlet of E5, so from 90 to, uh, and I'm going to 82.5. And I know that I will have to add uh, to end up the demand of the hot streams here a cool utility of 65 kilowatt, which is nice because this is exactly the amount that I needed. So it means that I don't have made any mistake in my calculations and I have enough to, to uh, supply uh, the need. So at the end, so what we can say is that I have designed a heat exchanger network because now the heat exchanger network is complete with the hot and the hot part of all the pinch and the, and the source part you know the pinch. And I have calculated for each of the heat recovery exchanges what is the investment that is needed in order to install all the heat exchanges. So now I have, I, and you can make the sum here. So the sum of the heat load gives you 385, which is the expected heat recovery in the system. Uh, I know that I have to supply some heat here and that I have to uh, remove 65 here, which is what was done with it. Okay? And now I know what is the amount of area that I have to buy. <coughs> I know what is the cost of this investment, which allows me then to tell my boss, okay, buy those heat exchanges, it should cost so much. And as I have collected the rights of the minimum, I can show you that you will uh, win money, uh, have a profit out of this heat exchange. Okay? Do you have questions there? Yeah? Yeah, but you are below the pitch. And the, the, the last, you are saying. The E3. The E3. Yeah. yeah, but I have split it. Huh? Yeah, but it's still higher. Than the other. So, this one is still higher than this. so the, this one has to be smaller than this one. Well, above the pinch, the NCP of the hot stream is smaller, it has a higher slope, so smaller than the NCP of the cold stream. Yeah, so, yeah. And, but I have the proof, huh? so it, it, you can see that you go from 150 to 90, and you go from 80 here to 135, so you are lower than. Uh, the, the temperature difference at the other side of the heat exchanger is bigger 
Yeah. Then, okay, that's because the, the MCP of the cold stream is uh, higher. Right? So 2.2 is higher than 2. Okay? So the cold stream is bigger or the hot stream is, is lower, okay? Okay. No problem. But 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 you're right. So so but but you will see that if you do the calculation, uh, the only problem is I have maybe now. Okay. But uh, typically, what when you calculate the temperature, so this temperature is known. Okay. This one is known. This allows you to obtain the 120, which is what is uh, available. And by using the 120 and asking uh, what it will be the temperature for the flow that you have here, you will see that you reach 135, which is uh, lower than 145, which would be the lead uh, here. So if, if you would have had here too, uh, you would have reached here 140. Okay? Other questions? If not, yeah. Yeah, the sum, so when you apply the MCP rule, okay, the sum applies to all the other ones. That are not connected to them. Okay? So it means it's, it's the definition of what is remaining to be done. And you have to be sure that when you select the heat exchanger, like the one that was in the beginning, okay? Uh, here, so when we are here, apparently it will work. If I'm connecting uh, this one and this uh, and uh, no, so, uh, this one and this one, okay? Apparently, it will work, but the remaining will not. <coughs> yeah. Okay. So just uh, uh, just to be sure that uh, what we are doing makes sense with the rest. So it's a safeguard to be sure that we will not do. Useless work because the problem is that if you have uh, 20 hot streams and, and, and 15 cold streams, the number of combinations is quite high. And when you take one decision, it has an impact on all the, the remaining one. Okay, so it means that it's important to be sure that from the really beginning, we are not going to lose our, our goal or miss our goal. Yeah. About the thing, the thing for the under CP of the course should be higher than the part, right? Yeah. Okay. I think not only for the important to say it's more of the course. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so it's for the course it's one point eight more. So yeah, but, but it is connected. Yeah. 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 So here you have uh, I should have written the, the flow here. Yeah. So it's it's one one point five, huh? Yeah. And here you have one point eight. Okay. So so and I have I must admit that uh, I I needed a rule to decide what how to get, to, to to do the the flow repartition. Okay. So I had a limit here, which was the flow here, and I had another limit which was the flow here, and between two and and uh, one one point. Uh, uh, 43, I, I still have a, free, a degree of freedom. Okay? And I decided to, to, to do a fair repartition between the two by saying that the best would be to mix at the same temperature here. Okay? My responsibility, it's not a, a, a tool for optimality, for sure. But uh, if you have to find the best value, then you have to solve an optimization problem, which would be much more complicated. Okay? So I've used rule of terms just to uh, identify where, where to go. Okay?
Right, so you have seen how to do it for the small exercise. size, so now you can do it for your uh, um, application. So you will have to calculate the heat exchanger network for the heat recovery that you have identified for the exercise. So uh, Francesca, Rafael, and uh, Alessio uh, will be there to help you. Um, and I must admit that if you do not do it by hand once, uh, you will not understand well how to how work. And I have also to admit that I did all those calculations by hand as well. Okay, so you are not the only one that has to do um, uh, exercise. And next week, uh, we are going to see if once we have a heat exchanger design, network design, if there is a way to improve the design. So can we find ways to reduce the cost, the overall cost of the system? And this will be the, uh, the mission of next week.